get started. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this opportunity again to gather with fellow saints to to uh, look into this exciting book. And uh, Lord, I just uh, our prayer this morning is that uh, we approach this humbly, not with. Uh, not sort of uh, preoccupied with our own thoughts of how things should be or what system we want to try to impose on your plans, but rather uh, with humble hearts that come to the scripture hungry to understand uh, what you will allow us to understand regarding uh, the end, regarding the, the resolution of human history. And so uh, we pray that you will bind us together in love and in uh, a deep appreciation for the word this morning. Um, bless our time of discussion as we fellowship around uh, your living word. And uh, we ask this in the name of our coming king, our hero, our high priest, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Uh, we, uh, we left off last week, uh, you know, just to kind of remind you where we're at. We're in Revelation chapter 4. And we started with the, the first verse of Revelation 4, which, in which John is invited to come up into heaven, in, into this open door that he sees, um, so, that, uh, so that the Lord can instruct him on things that must, uh, must come in the future. And so, as we pointed out, this is the beginning of the final part of the book of Revelation, which you know, lasts for all the way from chapter 4 through chapter 22. Everything we're talking about from this point on is what we call the eschaton, the end times, the last days. Everything before chapter 4, uh, in, in chapters 2 and 3, we were talking about the age of the church. But once you get to chapter 4, the church will not be mentioned anymore. It's out of the picture. Out of the picture. Okay? The next time you will come across that Greek word, ekklesia, which we translate church, will be all the way at the end of the book, in chapter 22, when Christ is instructing John to commit this testimony to the church. Okay? But, but until then, you're not going to hear about the church anymore uh, in this book. And that gives rise then to our looking into this issue that we call the rapture. Uh, and so last week we, we started to look at this, and my goal this week is that um, we take whatever time we need to take to where all of us are comfortable with this subject, and, and we understand what we believe and why we believe it, um, and if there's any lingering questions or issues that, that, uh, uh, that we have, let's talk about it. Okay, so uh, I, I want to guide us in that direction, but if, uh, if you have questions as we go, you know, these are genuine concerns that Christians have, and we'd like to uh, address those as best we can. And there's my backup, just in case, but just walk through the door. Good. Um, now, we, um, what have we done so far? Well, first of all, we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this is where uh, Paul tells us, he's reassuring the believers at Thessalonica that, uh, hey, don't freak out because your fellow believers have died. That's no big deal. Okay? It's not like, it's not like they died and now they're going to miss out on all the fun. No. No, what's going to happen, Paul says in this chapter, is that, you know, when the last trumpet sounds, the Lord is going to come down with a shout, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They're actually first in line. They're ahead of you. They're going to rise first. And then he says, and then we who, who remain will be caught up, snatched away, caught away. It's this word in Greek, harpazo. And that is the most basic word that we translate rapture. Okay, because as I shared with you before, this Greek word harpazo, which means to catch away, was translated from Greek into Latin. And the Latin equivalent of that word is the word raptoro. And from that Latin word raptoro, we pulled into English the English word rapture. Okay, and so the English word rapture traces its roots back to this Greek word harpazo. All right, questions about that? This is the great snatching away that Paul talks about. Then we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now 1 Corinthians 15 is really on its surface not about the rapture, 
It's about a related subject, one that's closely related to the rapture, and what is that? Resurrection. It's about resurrection. That's the whole point of that chapter. But in the course of explaining the resurrection, the phenomenon of resurrection to the Corinthian believers, Paul points out that that there are going to be what, he, what some of your Bibles call orders, orders of, of resurrection. Everyone in his order, it says, in verse 23. The, the Greek word here is the word tagma, which is a, a uh, military term. It essentially means battalion. Okay, So he says, the way the, re- the, way, the way the resurrection is going to unfold is according to battalions, like a parade. Now I'm going to show you a, uh, a chart because uh, a couple of you came up last week. I apparently confused... Uh, some folks on that. So I'm going to explain a little more detail when I get to the next slide. But before we do that, I want to go to the next passage, another critical passage, and that is Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. So flipping your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, and here's what Paul says. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that that they will be like His glorious body. Now there's a couple key things in there. First of all, toward the end of that verse there, you see the reference again to this physical transformation that you have in your future. Your earthly body... With all of its bad knees and and uh, indigestion and uh, hemorrhoids and all that other stuff you got to deal with, okay, is going to be transformed into something glorious, just as the Lord Jesus Christ is glorious in His resurrection. That is in your future, and when you get that body in the future, you will no longer be touched by disease, by infirmity by age, by violence, by anything. Your body will be immortal as it is intended to be, and you will spend eternity with the Lord uh, in, in physical perfection. That is what is coming. And so that's a blessing for us. That's a, that's a real clear blessing for us, because some of us face disease, serious disease, life-ending disease, perhaps. Some of us face just the pain in the rear infirmament you know, that, we, that we have all the time, like bad knees and uh, whatever, is, whatever is ailing you. Uh, and so we can look forward to this day when we're going to get this great possession from the Lord, this, this uh, resurrection body. But there's another thing uh, in, this, in this passage that's really important to note, and that's at the very beginning of verse 20. It says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now, what does that mean to you? Let's just discuss. This is a doctrinal fact. Your citizenship is in heaven. What does that mean to you, if anything? Please. It's where our allegiance belongs. It's where our allegiance belongs. Like our patriotism belongs there. It belongs there, right? Shouldn't you be patriotic towards your country? Well, our country is the kingdom of heaven, according to the scripture. Um, So I I think your point is well taken. Our allegiance belongs there. And, And that, I think, you know, as we, you know, some of us have discussed for years, that can be a tough test for a Christian, for an American Christian living in the 21st century because we're bombarded by politics all the time on television, in the newspapers, on the internet bombarded all the time as different factions in our country vie for our loyalty you know but what the scripture teaches is that we're unique we're unique people our citizenship, get this is not even on this planet It's in heaven. And in the kingdom that's coming from that heaven onto this planet. That's where our allegiance should be. By the way, uh, in verse 20 there when it says, in the NIV, it says, our citizenship is in heaven. 
What do your other versions say? Anyone have a different word there for citizenship? Conversation. 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 Anybody else? Would you like to know what the what the Greek word is? This is going to break some hearts. <laughs> well, I don't have it on the slide, so I'll have to spell it out, but uh, <coughs> That's the word in Greek, politoma, okay? And in our letters, it looks like this. Uh-oh. So you can see where that leads us. It's the word from which we get our English word, Politics! I saw somebody wake up in the back of the room there. I just said my favorite word. Politics! Let me run to Facebook. Well, according to this verse, our politics are anchored in heaven. Not on earth. Not in a political party here on earth. It's not anchored to the right or to the left, or to the center, or to the center right, or the far left, or anything else, it's anchored in heaven. That's where we belong, all right? Difficult, difficult if you are um, if you are hooked to politics. Uh, anyone want to comment on that, thoughts? Are there other places that it talks about that? Uh, are there other places that it talks about that? Indeed there are. Uh, turn to... Uh, uh, Hebrews, book of Hebrews, and let's go to, uh, let's go to, uh, this is called an unprepared teacher, let's go to, uh, well first of all, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, um, and we're going to start there, and then we're going to go over to chapter 13. But uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, 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 not just sin, everything that hinders and, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Ronald Reagan. Is that what it says? <laughs> no. Let us fix our eyes on Fox News. Is that what it says? No. It says fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary in his heart. Now flip over to chapter 13. And uh, I'd like you to read, uh, let's start reading in verse 11 of chapter 13. And it says this, The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most, high, uh, the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. Verse 12, And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For we do not have an enduring city. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Now, again, I hate to break your heart, but guess what the Greek word for city is? It's polis. The same word from which we get politics. We do not have here an enduring polis. Our polis is the one that is coming from heaven. Okay? And if that verse is meaningful to you, and if you intend to follow what the scripture teaches in that regard, then it's going to challenge you at your gut level about where your loyalties are, where your patriotism is, where your allegiance is. What are you really about? Are you about politics on the left or the right? Or are you about Jesus Christ, the coming King, the most excellent of men? I would suggest to you, some of you will leave the room, that you cannot have both. Okay? You are either 
you are either patriotic toward the Lord and His coming kingdom, or you are ensconced in the filth of politics on this earth. Okay? Tough choice. Go ahead. In Colossians 3.1, it's the first class condition if since you were raised with Christ seeking those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God when we're in Christ we are actually positionally seated at the right hand of God with him set your mind on the things above and Excellent. not on the things on earth you died and your life is hidden with him Excellent. so where he is located is where we are because we are and yeah. Christ. yeah, this is an excellent point. I'm going to, I'm going to repeat it because just make sure everybody heard it because this is a, it's a really great point you make. And this is kind of found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. And uh, you, I very much admire your scholarship because you're exactly right. Since then, in this first class condition, since then you have been raised with Christ. This is a fact. This is a doctrinal fact that Paul is saying. It's, it's not a question. It is. You have been raised with Christ. Now, therefore, this is what you should do about that doctrinal fact. Set your hearts on things where? In, in Washington, D.C.? No. Things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And this is the whole idea of being baptized into Christ. This, you know, When you get dunked under the water, it's an illustration of this verse. You have died. And all earthly connection is severed. And then you're pulled back alive again in Christ. Now you have a new life. And it's based in heaven, not on earth. Okay? So, pretty key passage. Again, we kind of wandered from, from rapture stuff, but it's all, you know, Philippians 3, 20 and 21 teach us, first of all, that our citizenship is in heaven. And this becomes a crucial issue in properly interpreting Revelation, uh, which we'll see a little bit later. Keep in mind, you're a citizen of heaven, okay? Uh, but the second thing there is in verse 21, the idea of your body being transformed into, into Christ's glorious body, and, and that is part of uh, the resurrection. Now, uh, last week uh, I mentioned this idea, and this is just my little made-up way I think about it, the resurrection parade, you know, and I'm drawing from... 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where it says each in his own order, each in his own tagma, right here. That's the Greek word, tagma, order, battalion. Paul is illustrating what the resurrection looks like, the phenomena of, resur of resurrections within uh, the human race. And here's what he says. First of all, Christ, the first fruits. The first resurrection of a human being happened in 32 AD when Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb. That was the beginning. That was the great strategic blow to Satan and the, and the reversal of death. Jesus Christ brought alive again after his substitutionary death as the first fruits of resurrection. The next battalion that comes down the, the pike is the church being raptured. When is that going to happen? Does anyone know? No. Anytime. Oh, come on. Soon. Give me a date. Anytime. Soon. Give me a year. Soon. <laughs> I know, but I'm not telling. <laughs> well, for a small fee after class. No, that's right. All right, so we don't know. It's an unknown day. It's, a, it's, it's an unknown day. It is imminent. We are to live our lives expecting this at any moment. And it should reflect in our behavior. Okay, that, that we expect this at any moment. That's the church that's going to be raptured. The royal priesthood. Okay, the royal priesthood is going to be raptured. The church. In, in whole, in, in, not in part. You know, it's not this idea that if you're a good Christian, you're going to be raptured. No, a whole bunch of you really bad Christians are also going to be raptured. Okay, it's not going to be a real pleasant day for you because then you're going to face the judgment seat of Christ. And when you face the judgment seat of Christ, we know that some of us, in facing that judgment, will be embarrassed, and we will weep, and we will regret missed opportunities, and we will regret the sin that we engaged in. But at the end of that judgment, all tears will be wiped away, and we will proceed uh, to be with Christ and to, and to join Him in His kingdom. Others of you, and I have no doubt, many of you in this room, 
that day will be very joyous for you, the, the, the beam of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, because you're going to be rewarded for your good works. You're going to be rewarded for your faithfulness in prayer, for your self-restraint in dealing with friends and family, for your bold witness at work, okay, or for discipling your children uh, in, in Christ. You're going to be rewarded for that. And so it's, uh, it, it's going to be a, a very good experience uh, for us. But that's going to happen future unknown day when the church is harpazoed out, when we're caught away. What's the next battalion coming down the street? The next one is all associated with the second advent of Jesus Christ. The second advent is going to look like this. Christ is going to come back. Uh, his... The fact that he is coming back will be universally known because the Bible says that the world will see, they will look up and see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds with power and they will mourn. The nations will mourn because they are against him and they don't want him to come. But believers who are alive during the tribulation are desperate for him to come and they know exactly when he's coming. They are marking the days off the wall and they know exactly the day that he's coming. Because they are told the day that he's coming, during the tribulation, he is coming exactly three and a half years following this horrendous event that's going to occur called the abomination of desolation. And so when believers see that happen, they will start counting down to the moment of the second advent. When the second advent occurs, according to Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, the Old Testament saints, everybody from Adam all the way through until the beginning of the age of the church, all believers who died under the Old Testament, like the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and those believers during the tribulation who were martyred, who died because of their faith, they together will be resurrected shortly after the second advent of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at this one in uh, Revelation. Well, let's go to Daniel first so you can see the, one of the uh, key passages here. Go to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. And uh, in case you ever run across one of these theological Weisenheimers that tells you that resurrection is, an, is a New Testament concept and not discussed in the Old Testament, that is manifestly untrue. It is, in fact, discussed quite a bit in the Old Testament, and this is one of those locations. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, that is Israel, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. What does that tell you about the nature of the tribulation? It's really bad. It has never happened before. It has never happened before. That is key. Okay? Now, this is an important point because what you have to understand about the nature of the tribulation is the tribulation is a discontinuity in human history. It's a discontinuity. In other words, and Jesus teaches on this in, in, uh, in Matthew 24. Up until the point of the tribulation, you have church age history. It's been going on for about 2,000 years now. And church age history just kind of, it goes on. There are cycles. There's wars, and then there's rumors of wars. There's peace, there's this, there's that, there are other, you know, there's, there's earthquakes, there's you know, famines, there's d disease, pestilence, whatever. And then there's good things that happen, and it's just a whole bunch of cycles. And they just go on and on and on and on and on. And then the rapture occurs. And at that point, Human history stops, and we enter eschaton, a discontinuity. There is, that's, that's kind of the point in prophecy. The, the Old Testament prophets, when they foresaw it, they, they described it this way. They asked a rhetorical question, and their rhetorical question was, has anything like this ever happened in the days of our fathers? And what answer are they anticipating? No, nothing like this has ever happened. That's what they said when they saw prophetically the tribulation. Okay? Yes? Ma, the ESV says there's uh, never been anything like this since there was a nation. So I was thinking of the time of Noah. Yeah. And um, elsewhere, um, I think in Matthew 24, 
the end times, the eschaton, is compared to the days of Noah. It is compared to the days of Noah, but it's compared to the days of Noah because of timing issues and readiness issues and preparedness and 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 the pervasiveness of unbelief among the among the people. Okay, among the, among unbelievers. So that is a that's a valid comparison to make, but. In terms of the character of the tribulation and the extreme evil of the of the tribulation, it is unlike the days of Noah. Okay, and this is why the this is why the the, the prophets ask this question: Is has anything ever before ever uh, happened like this? Because during the tribulation, several things are going to occur that have never occurred before. For example, you will see the final, most powerful, most satanically inspired form of human government in the tribulation. Uh, during the, our lives, during the church age, we can look at various governments like Hitler, you know, or Stalin, or uh, Pol Pot, or, uh, or, or even in our own nation, you know, we may look at the government and say, well, that's satanic. And then in many cases, you're right, it is satanic. But it is nothing compared to the tyranny of the beast that rises in Revelation 13. That is the apex of satanic arrogance and evil. It is so bad, Jesus tells us, that were these days not shortened, he's referring to the tribulation, no one would survive. It is a death machine. That is what is coming in the, in the tribulation. It's a death machine. And, and so nothing like that. <laughs> Uh, has ever happened. There are some similarities to Noah, but is that you see what I'm saying? And and you know you'll this will become more obvious as we get into it. The tribulation is a discontinuity. Nothing like it has ever occurred. And and this is good, folks. This is not people. You know you kind of look at it and think, well, that's terrible. Why would God do that? You know why God does that? Because He loves you. Because He loves people. And he's using the discontinuity of the tribulation to reach out one final time and say, believe in Christ as your Savior. This is it. The King is coming. Emergency. This is it. You know, the angel will fly across the sky, Revelation says, and declaring woe to the world and, and urging people to, to believe and to... And to uh, uh, you know, break the allegiance that they have to, to the earth and to the, the powers of the earth. And instead, look for that coming king and put their faith in him. Okay? And it's going to be so obvious to everybody who's living through it that this is something new. That it's going to be a real attention getter. And by the way, millions and millions of people will turn to Christ during the tribulation. Millions of them will. And in part, because of this obvious change in the course of human history that is going on, okay? So it is, as Daniel says, such has not happened uh, from the beginning of nations until then, but then keep reading. But at that time, your people, referring to Israel, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Okay? This is a, refer, a reference to the resurrection of Old Testament saints at the time that the Messiah comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It will happen soon after he fights the Armageddon campaign. And right after that, he's going to resurrect. Now, if you go over to Revelation 20, you'll see the New Testament version of the same exact phenomenon. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20. And <clears throat> uh, let's go down to verse, uh, we'll start verse 4. And it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. This is a reference not to all Christians who have been beheaded, but to tribulation Christians who have been beheaded. Okay, uh, this is during the last seven years. Uh, they had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, 
Uh, this is the, the description of the, the resurrections associated with the second advent. And you'll notice in that passage that it said, referring to this, this is the first resurrection. Now, if it says it's the first resurrection, then why is this loudmouth Bible teacher saying that it's the third resurrection? You know, because if this is the first resurrection, then what is this? <laughs> It was a mystery first. It was a mystery. That's a really good answer. That's a sneaky answer. It's not, not exactly right, but it's a really cool answer. But, you know, it's a good way of kind of dodging the question. You know, but yeah. They're all the first. Go ahead. Because Christ was the first resurrection, and in that resurrection, but all the others are resurrected. Yeah. Yeah. So what we got to understand here is this: these resurrections right here all together are the first resurrection, okay? And the reason that they're grouped together is because they're grouped together as a part of the resurrections that occur when Christ returns. Now, when the Bible says when Christ returns or when Christ comes, it is using that Greek word parousia, parousia, all right? The coming of Christ, the parousia of Christ, question, is it something that is instantaneous or is it something that is a process? It is, in fact, a process. All right? The parousia of Christ is not referring to the moment that he lands on the Mount of Olives. It's referring to everything that occurs from the moment the Father says to the Son, Go, I am, I'm, I'm now going gonna, gonna to have you reign as King of Kings. Go! And Christ begins his movement toward the earth. And one of the first things that happens is he leaves the third heaven, comes to the second heaven, and raptures the church. And we join him, and so will we ever be with him. That's like the first act of the parousia. So this is part of the first resurrection program. This is another part of the first resurrection program. There is also a third, or a fourth part, I should say, that is... Oh, you know, you can sort of say it was stated, but it's more implied. And that's the, the idea that at the end of the millennial kingdom, at the end of the kingdom, after the final God Magog rebellion, there is evidently a final resurrection of millennial saints, some of whom have died and are buried, and some of whom are still alive that have survived the kingdom period and survived the God-Magog rebellion, they also will have their bodies transformed. And this is why in Revelation 20 it says the rest of the people won't be resurrected until the end of the kingdom. Yeah. So the first resurrection is to the second life and the second resurrection is to the second death. Exactly. You got it. That's right. right. And that's, what, that's kind of the point that, that this makes here. Because... You know, taking all these, and then this one being applied, but taking all these together, we refer to as the first resurrection. That is, the resurrection to blessedness and to eternal life. Now, when the Bible, when, when Revelation says this is the first resurrection, you would assume, you would assume, would you not, that there's going to be mention of a second resurrection, right? This reminds me of being in basic training. When I went to basic training in 1976, I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and, and I was uh, laying in my bunk the first night, nervous, scared, what's going to happen the next day? You know, these drill sergeants look so mean and everything. And, uh, and the next day, the next morning, at about 4 o'clock in the morning, this big, burly guy comes into the room and is banging trash can lids together, and he says, First call! So I, in my little 18-year-old mind, I'm thinking, well, first call, I think I'll wait for the second call. <laughs> you know, there is no second call. The second call is when he comes and dumps you out of your bunk onto on the floor, okay, and then you do push-ups. Uh, in the same way, the Bible talks about a first resurrection, but never makes mention of a second one. But it implies a second one, because later in this chapter, it talks about Hades and death giving up their dead, and so that these people can appear in judgment before the great white throne. And then it goes on to say, these people whose names are not found in the book of life are then thrown into the lake of fire. And this is called the second death. 
Okay, that is what it's called in Scripture. They're resurrected for death. All right, and they will. Here's the sad part. Once you're resurrected, you live forever. But it's called the second death because they're going to spend that eternity in the lake of fire and separated from God. That's the harsh side of God's program. They chose to, to appear before this great white throne in their own righteousness, defying God's authority and defying the plan of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. And so they will stand in front of that judgment and their works will be read out. There's a big, long, big, big database of, of, uh, of works that these people have done, some of which, many of which, are good works. Good works. These people, that guy right there is going to stand there and list all of his good works. He's going to explain to Jesus Christ that he was a member of a church, he was giving money to the church, he was helping old ladies across the street, he was nice to his children, he put up with his wife, he, you know, all this other stuff, he never, he didn't steal much from work, you know, all his other good, good deeds that he did. Good deeds that he did. And an angel is going to be standing there with a calculator, a good works calculator. Okay, and uh, what, what do we got? Insufficient. It comes up as insufficient. It does not match the righteous standard of, of God. And so there is no other place for you other than the lake of fire. Uh, by the way, uh, who was the lake of fire created for? What was the purpose of the lake of fire? <laughs> was it for mankind? No. No. It's, it was not intended for mankind. It was intended for the devil and his angels. How sad is that? To have a faith that takes you into a place not prepared for you. Jesus said, I have prepared a place for you, believers. But he didn't prepare the lake of fire for you. He prepared it for the devil and his angels. But these people have volunteered to go there. Because they reject the salvation program. The so great salvation that, that God offered in the person of Christ. So that is a picture of the final word of resurrection. The second resurrection, as it were, leading to the second death. What are your questions about that? Do you understand the resurrection timeline? Okay. 32 AD, unknown day, known day, second advent, end of the millennium, at the end of the kingdom, and then finally, these knuckleheads here will be will have their own version of resurrection. Yeah. This would probably take an entire lesson in its own, on its own. But um, this raises the question, if there are going to be people who think they should be getting into heaven that don't, how can a person know for sure that they are among the ones that will get in and not be deceived? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, we know, without a doubt, that there are people in the human race who will expect to be welcomed into heaven because this is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 25. They will say, Lord, Lord, what's going on here, man? Do you, do you know who I am? Look at this name tag here. I, I did things in your name. You know, they're going to say, I, I absolutely deserve to go to heaven. And the Lord is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. All right? So definitely those people are deceived. Now the question, the, the really important part of your question is, how can we know that we're on the right side? And that is a big subject in the New Testament. Uh, the way that you know is that you anchor your understanding of salvation in one thing and one thing alone. Jesus Christ. That is the bedrock. And if you are anchored in that bedrock... <coughs> then the rest of the New Testament is going to assure you over and over and over and over again that you are eternally secure. Paul put it this way in Romans. He basically listed all these things that could happen. Could anything separate us from Christ? And then he goes down the big long list, including angels. And of course the answer he's anticipating is no. Nothing can separate us once we are anchored in Christ through faith. Okay, please. How are we sure that we are anchored? How are we sure that we are anchored in Christ? It's a very simple subject in the Bible. That is not theologically difficult. It says this in Scripture. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right. Okay? There are times that I have thought to myself, am I really a Christian? Sure. Because of the things that I did. And right. I'm really sure. And she brings up a good point that, you know, there are times when we all feel like, I think I've lost my salvation. I'm not even sure I'm a Christian. I'm not even sure I'm a Christian. Well, here's what happens. Okay? <laughs> Here's what the New Testament teaches about this. There, here's the reality. And here is the 
uh, we'll call it the assurance. Assurance situation. The reality is you are, once you've placed your faith in Christ, eternally saved. You were in Adam, and now you are no longer in Adam. Now you are in Christ. You are eternally saved. You have passed from death into life, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's blessed Son. This is a fact. Now, does that mean that you're wise enough, well instructed enough, faithful enough, aware enough of this fact that you are eternally assured? No. The, because what happens in our Christian life is we all do what you just said. I have days where I feel like, man, I'm a super Christian. I'm awesome. God must really, but I have no doubt in my mind I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven, and not only that, I'm going to get all these kind of awesome rewards. And then the next day, I fight with my brother like I did this week, and I, and I feel like I, I am a complete loser. I, I'm the worst Christian there ever was. I've completely let down the Lord. I'm a disgrace, and I don't feel saved today. Has that changed this? No. You're just a depressed, eternally saved person. That's all. And tomorrow you'll be up again, and the next day you'll be down again. But this is all about assurance. Now the way you boost this assurance and get this assurance where it should be, so that you're confident all the time, is, number one, get in, ensconced in a local church. Ensconced means you're, you don't just stumble in half sober on Sunday. It means you're in there, you're committed to your church, to fellow believers who are your brothers and sisters. You're committed to serving them, ministering with them, growing with them, exercising your gift in your, in your church. And, and as you do that, the more you serve, and I know there's many of you, men and women in this room right now, who know exactly what I'm talking about. The more you serve... That boosts your assurance because you're walking closer and closer with Christ, depending on Him, depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you live your life that way, day in and day out, there is no doubt in your mind where you stand. However, if you are eternally saved and then you walk away from your church, you, you just don't go very often, and you're not really paying much attention to it, and pretty soon you get distracted by sin, and and uh, two years later you're uh, uh, heavily dependent on alcohol, and you're having an affair with somebody, and you're deeply involved in sin, you're going to be down here, and you're going to be thinking, I think I, I, I've lost my salvation, I just don't feel it anymore, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm a disgrace. And yes, you are. That's true. You are a disgrace. But you have not lost your salvation. You are eternally saved. You're just a really poor Christian. That's all. And when you die, you're going to go into heaven in disgrace. And you're going to suffer embarrassment at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the reality. All right? So, so this is a struggle we all have. All of us have this. But the way you get over it is grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, fellowship with your other with other saints, confess your sin on a daily basis. You know, these are the, this is what the scripture is all about. This is what the New Testament is about. Yeah. And, and don't go by feelings. Don't go by feelings. What right. God says in our righteousness are still be rags. Is we have Christ's righteousness imputed at the moment. And that's the thing. All those works that those people had, it all adds up to it's not good enough. God, yeah. Adam, Excellent point. And what, yeah. Counts. And it's what she, you know, she just said it so perfectly there. This is not about, you know, being eternally saved is not about my performance. It's about the righteousness that has been imputed to me by the substitutionary death of Christ. And that is perfect. It's perfect on Sunday morning. And it's perfect on Thursday afternoon, okay? And it's, it doesn't matter what I'm doing or how good I feel or bad I feel. That imputed righteousness is mine forever. That is the basis of my salvation. Yeah. Second um, Peter chapter one is a prescription for assurance. There. Yeah. Let's go to that. Your faith. Second Peter chapter one. Point us to the where you're talking about. Uh, verse five. Verse five. So Second Peter chapter one verse five. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. 
For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. That was right. That's exactly the right passage to go to. You see the dilemma there. Two different kinds of believers, both going to heaven, but one of them is growing constantly and going through edification upon edification upon edification because he's following the direction of Scripture, because he's following his leaders in, in his local church. The other one has been distracted, has fallen into sin, and has forgotten something. And it's so easy to forget. Okay? Love, Satan loves it when you forget your salvation. Yeah. It builds on if you want to read this because I'm on the microphone. 1 yeah. Corinthians 3. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. 11. For no other foundation can anyone in the way they had some of them. Yeah, so and, right. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, you start in verse uh, uh, 10. Well, it, yeah, my paragraph starts in 10 there. Uh, Paul saying, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. Verse 11, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man, and here Paul is talking about other apostles, that's actually what he's talking about, other church leaders, and he's saying this, to, he's warning those church leaders, okay, and he's saying this, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, that's category one, gold, silver, costly stones, these are good things, okay, now comes the second category, bad things, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it into light. What day? The eschaton. And part of the eschaton is the rapture of the church and following the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And that's what this passage is about, the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and it says, because the day will bring it to light, it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. This is describing many of you sitting here today who have built on the foundation of salvation in Christ and you have built a life of service and good works resting on the, in the power of the Holy Spirit and drawing on the power of Jesus Christ you have built gold, silver, precious stones upon this foundation and you are due for great reward reward that will last for eternity you'll be talking about it billions of years from now Okay, that's what's in store for many of you Here's what's in store for some. Verse 5. If it is burned, that is his good works, so to speak, his works are burned, he will suffer loss. Loss of salvation? No. no. Loss of reward. He will be embarrassed and will lose reward. But, it goes on to say, he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Okay? You know what it looks like when you're escaping through the flames? It's like your house is on fire. How many possessions do you take with you when you're running out of your house when it's on fire? None. None. In fact, you don't even have any clothes on, probably, because they got burned off. So you're running out, buck naked, out the door, screaming. Okay? That's the way some people are going to go into eternity, into, into heaven. Why? Because they have nothing left. Everything that they built their life on is back in the house on fire. But the faithful believers who have built on, on that foundation are coming away with great reward because they have honored Christ. They have brought glory to Christ. And now he, in turn, is very pleased to reward them and bring glory to them. All right, as he describes in Luke chapter 12. Yeah. I never looked at this with the context you were talking about before, but because I always thought that verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. I always thought that meant that if a person commits suicide, they're going to hell. No, no, no. But this is talking about... False teachers right. destroying. Yeah, this is this is a warning. This is Paul. You got to keep the context in mind here. Paul is talking about the problem uh, that he referred to at the beginning of this book, where he said, uh, "You're all carnal." This one says, "I'm a Paul, and I have Cephas, or you know, and I have Cephas, and I have you know, I have, I have Apollos, and I have Christ." The church is split into all these factions, and and some of these people that are coming to the church are false teachers who are bad mouthing other apostles, and so Paul is saying, "Look." I was the wise master builder. I laid the foundation. And then these other people come along. Some of them are good teachers, teaching correctly, teaching with the right motivation. They're true, genuine believers, and they're good servants, and they're my fellow apostles. And some of them are a bunch of scoundrels. 
and they don't know what they're messing with because they think they're just playing power politics in the church and they don't understand. They're messing with the temple, the temple of God. And if you mess with the temple of God, it's a death sentence. Now that death sentence, if you're an unbeliever, that means a lake of fire. If you're a genuine believer and you're messing with the temple, then you're going to suffer loss, another form of death, okay? But not eternal death in that, in that case. That's what it's about, okay? Yeah? I think sometimes we lose the simplicity of Christ's plan. I don't go to church to be a Christian. I go to church because I am a Christian. Yeah. But if I'm ever going to be the Christian Christ created me to be, it's not going to happen outside of the context of a local church. I agree. Amen. And that, that is right on the money. And that needs to be reiterated in the 21st century because there are too many Internet Christians lurking around in their basement uh, believing that uh, somehow I can get everything I need because, I mean, look at all the theology that's available on the, on the internet. That's all I need. No, that isn't what you need. You need to be in an active in a local church where you can exercise your gift. How are you exercising your gift if you're standing at a computer screen? Explain that to me. That's not possible. You must be in a church. Yeah. One more indulgence. Please. I don't go to church to go to heaven. I go to church because I'm on my way to heaven, yeah. and I'm preparing for it. Right. And I don't want to show up for eternity empty-handed. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, well said. Uh, I agree completely. And his point there is that uh, you know we don't go to church to find salvation. We go to church because we are saved, and we are uh, working together, fellowshipping together, celebrating together, ministering to each other. That's what church is about. And uh, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, well said. Uh, any other questions about this issue? Yeah. I just want to mention that for those that have the ability to go to a church, that's where they need to be, to be serving in the body. But there are those in certain nations or certain countries sure. where they're either isolated because they're in prison or yeah. there just is no ability to go no, to church. That's true. Although I, I will tell you that I, I'm privileged to be part of a prison ministry uh, of, a, of a bunch of believers in Roxbury uh, Correctional Facility up in Maryland. That's one of the most dynamic churches I've ever been in. I'm telling you what, they are some serious believers and they're very good Bible students. And I, they surprised me, you know. Because I, I went there, you know, started there some years ago and uh, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, you know, it's the first time I was really ever in an environment like that. I thought, well, you know, I better take it easy on these guys because they probably don't know much, you know, much about the scripture. So I started teaching, and they're like, "Whoa, yeah!" And they're answering the questions in Greek, and, you know. So I'm like, "Okay, well, let's okay, let's you know dig into this." I mean, there's some really fine, you know, fine and dynamic Christians there, uh, men who, through past sin and mistakes, you know, are, are incarcerated, uh, but they found salvation there, and they'll be the first to tell you, "I'm glad I'm in prison because I found Christ in here," you know, and. They're sharing it in a very harsh environment. So, uh, yeah, but your point's well taken. Not everybody has access to a local church, but, uh, yeah, go ahead, Susan. I'm thinking about the, the confusion that there is within Christian circles regarding works, and they'll often kind of bring up about the, the unsaved to go and announce their works. And, yeah. Um, and, and just kind of processing through that or trying to teach my children, it, it would be like... It would be like joining into a marathon and running it and not registering for it and expecting the reward. Yeah. You know, just the and the there we're we're required to be seeking after. We're required to be working for God. Right. But there is a difference between are you are you in it? Are you registered for it? Are you going to get credit for these things or not? Right. Uh, and Susan brings up a good point, and, and this is this is something that has plagued the church and plagued Christian theology since the beginning. Um, and uh, again, one of the many reasons I adore this church and, and the leadership of this church is because they're right where they should be on this issue. And and the issue is, has to do with what about works? What, what about works? I don't get it. Well, part of the problem is if you think of the spectrum, you have a whole group of, of uh, so-called churches, factions, that basically teach in one form or another works-based salvation, uh, lordship salvation. In other words, oh yeah, we believe in that. Yeah, believe in Jesus. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, we, yeah we're certainly in favor of that. Yeah, by all means, believe in Jesus. But if you want to go to heaven, you got to do more than just believe in Jesus. God expects you to work. You know, and, and if you don't, you can't just get away with this I believe in Jesus stuff and think you're going to heaven. No, 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 no. You gotta work and prove it. 
Now, there's various forms of that kind of theology out there. Where does it come from? It comes from Satan. Okay, it is, it is anti-Bible. It, it is not true at all. If you could work your way to salvation, then Christ died in vain. He, his, his death was purposeless. Okay, yeah. It's like saying Christ's work wasn't enough. Right, it's like saying Christ's work wasn't enough. And that's blasphemy. Because Christ's death is a holy thing. It's a holy phenomenon. And, and he did not die as a martyr. He died as a substitute. No one else has ever done that. All right? And it, is, it was what we call efficacious. In other words, it worked perfectly. All right? So works-based salvation does, does, is not biblical. Yeah. But if you have the Spirit of God, you will bear fruit. Now, that's the other thing. The other form of this apostasy related to works is works, we'll call it, I'll just make this up, works free uh, well, let's say works free Christian life. Okay, and the way this comes around about is that you have, you know, you have some guy come and tell you, oh yeah, I reject this completely. Works based salvation? No, 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 no. We're all about grace. Faith alone in Christ alone, it's just grace. For by right. grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, lest any man, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. And then they go over here and live their life completely devoid of good works. Okay? And think, well, see, why is it that I don't do good works? Because I'm a grace-oriented Christian. No. You don't do good works because you're a sinful, loser, terrible Christian. That's why you don't do works. It has nothing to do with grace. It has to do with obedience. Are you obeying or not? Hey, sports fans, we were saved for good works. The Bible is very clear on that. It says we were saved for good works. To do them. You know, just like the pastor was teaching today. He didn't say, he didn't wash the feet of the disciples and say, focus on the theology of what I've just done. No, he said, do this. Do it. Just like I did it. Yeah. Yeah. So all the warnings about if you live this way, you will not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It's, it means this. It means this. If you live a life of the loser believer, or, for that matter, let's talk about this dude, who's a winner believer. Boy, he's really he's a believer and successful, doing really well, doing really well, and then he drops the ball at the end. He dropped like uh, Uzziah. Uh, frankly, kind of like David in a way. You know, David was doing great, and then dropped the ball in a big way. Solomon. Yeah, and Solomon. Solomon's another one, okay? These are believers who, who end poorly, okay? What happens to them? Well, we can't be sure about that because that's really going to be up to the judge as to where this guy is. But, but the point is that, that if you are a believer in Christ and you're a loser believer or you, you were not faithful, you didn't produce good works like you were supposed to, are you going into the kingdom? Oh, yes, you're going into the kingdom. You are going into it. Are you going to inherit in the kingdom. That's a different story. Inherit means you get stuff. Property. Okay? That's inheritance. That's a different thing than being part of the kingdom. You were going to say? The, uh, the easy way to think about it is there is no inheritance if you're not an heir. Yeah, that's Romans, right. If you want to use your scripture, which I try to do, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, Paul's talking to believers, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs of God. Separate category coming up. And joint heirs yeah. with Christ, we, we inherit what he has inherited if, right. it's a big if, if indeed we suffer with him that is going through the vessel of honor, vessel of dishonor, yeah. that we may also be glorified together. That is a separate group of people. Everyone's an heir if they believe in Jesus as their Savior. Inheritance in the New Testament is never talked about for being saved. Yeah. It's all this about a, reward. Yeah, it's that, a good passage. Yeah, it is. It's really, the, I would say, the nominal, the, the, uh, the normative passage for this. Uh, uh, again, she pointed us to uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, and she's right on the money. It's talking about the, the issue of, of heirship and inheritance. Um, and if you are a believer in Christ, there is no guarantee of inheritance. There is guarantee of, of eternal security, eternal life, but no guarantee of, of reward or inheritance. Please. The great thing about guy number three yeah. 
is what that does for those of us that slip in and out of loserism yeah. gives us hope. That's right. It does give us hope because we're all sort of like in this category from time to time. You know? And this is a, this is the kind of guy that's gonna be surprised when he when he wakes up in heaven. Okay? He's, or he's gonna be surprised when he's raptured. This guy's gonna be surprised when he's not raptured. Or when he's not, when he doesn't uh, necessarily go. Because or this guy, you know, this guy thinks he's going to heaven, or may think that, but he's not. This guy thinks he's going to hell and he's gonna to go to heaven instead. So yeah. I think that sense that he must be missed, but it's a very last act. Yeah. After he can he miss yeah, Samson. Samson, the guy who finished well, finished. lived his whole life like like a mess. And another guy uh, like that is uh, uh, Abijah, the king of, of Judah, who basically blew it his whole life. He was a, a very poor king, but at the very end of his life, he fought the battle of uh, Mount Zemarim and shined because he latched on to doctrine, and that was the key to the victory. Because he said, "No, wait a minute, wait a minute." I've been outmaneuvered, surrounded, outnumbered. I completely blew this battle tactically. But we serve the living God, and his priests are in Jerusalem, not Samaria. And we're going to win this fight. And then the priests blow the trumpet and wipe out the bad guys. It was really cool. Uh, Baja, he's, a, he's an example of a guy that blew it his whole life, except at the very end. Okay, so, but then, uh, you know, there are others that uh, are just the opposite. Uh, by the way, let's not forget this guy. And this is the winner believer, and this is the this is the guy or gal who, for the most part, not perfectly, because none of us are perfect. Wow, no, none of us are perfect. Okay, none of us are perfect. But for the most part, this guy has or gal have, has confessed his sins routinely, has stayed con very vitally connected to his local church has grown in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, has served others, has exercised his or her gift, and has brought glory to Christ. And this may be in ways that nobody sees. It's not about the way the world works, where oh, you got to be up on the stage and everyone's looking at you. No, many of these people are doing what they're doing pri privately. Uh, in uh, their praying, the prayer warriors, or their giving to causes that are that are investing in the kingdom, or their counseling people in the local church one on one, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or a homeschool mother raising her kids in Christ. Homeschool mother is an excellent point. Or they're running a camera for to to help people, you know, <laughs> get, get Sunday school. There are all kinds of things that you can do that the world may look at and think, well, that's no big deal. Well, Jesus thinks it's a big deal, and he's going to talk about it in front of angels, in front of the most important beings in the universe, you are going to be discussed. Your name is going to be spoken of by Christ in front of these angels because of the service you're doing. That's where the New Testament is pointing us. It wants us to be this. The New Testament does not want you to test the theology of this guy as to whether is this guy really saved or not. Maybe say, I think I'll live a really terrible life and find out if I really am saved or not. Well, that's not the point, man. The point is to leave that behind and invest in this coming kingdom. Okay? Now, we're way off track. Yes, go ahead. The <laughs> final point on this is something that Jesse had said. Don't be, don't say, well, at least I'm not there to see it. Yeah, at least I'm not there to see it. Don't set your sights low. Set your sights high. Yeah, good point. Now, um, yeah, so we talked about this, uh, you know, the rapture, pre-tribulation rapture. That is our position. And you're aware that there are others, the mid-tribulation rapture, the pre-wrath rapture, the post-tribulation rapture, and all that. We think those are various flavors of wrong, okay? So uh, so we don't teach them. Uh, again, do I consider this a, a, you know, a huge theological issue? No, I don't. Uh, I think that, you know, genuine people of good intent uh, may have differences on this. Uh, but I think that the scripture is fairly clear that, that, uh, that pre-tribulation rapture is correct. Um, and I just want to, uh, and I'll, again, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, I'm going to just kind of go through this. But this is what I just told you. There's a partial rapture position, and, you know, there's, there's these various ones. But we, uh, we teach uh, uh, pre-tribulation rapture. It is associated with the term dispensationalism. So if you are a dispensational premillennial, as you certainly should be, and if you're not yet, you will be after you die, uh, dispensational means pre-tribulation rapture. That's what it means. Because why, why is it that a that dispensational understanding of Scripture must lead to a pre-tribulation rapture? Why? Yeah. Because uh, God is teaching us through each dispensation um, his, he's teaching us that each way 
that we think that we can get to heaven, we can't except through Christ. Okay. So we're going through no law, we're going through yeah. law, we're going through grace. Yeah, I agree with that. I do agree with that. And that's, that is a good point. The point I was driving at, though, was that, that one of the foundational tenets of dispensational interpretation is that Israel and the church are two separate bodies. They're two separate destinies. And the tribulation is all about Israel. It's all about preparing Israel and judging the earth dwellers. The church is not Israel, and the church is not an earth dweller. What did, what did Philippians chapter 20 say? Where is your politics? Where is your citizenship? Heaven. You're not an earth dweller. The tribulation is about punishing and judging earth dwellers. You're not an earth dweller, so you're not going to be in that. That's not That program is not for you. Okay? Uh, secondly, uh, well, that's what I just said. This, this reinforces the, the, the distinction. Um, Revelation 3.10 in the, in the letter to Philadelphia, you know, Christ specifically gives this promise to the church, and we believe to the church as all of them. I will keep you from, not just from the trial, but from the hour of the trial. Okay, we believe that is a prophecy of, uh, of a pre-tribulation rapture. And as I'm running out of time, I'll just get to the end of this. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of class, the, the term that is translated church, ecclesia, is not mentioned in, from chapters 4 through 22 of Revelation. You know, very conspicuously absent any reference to the church during the, during the Bible's description of the tribulation. That should tell you something, okay, that the church is not there. And then uh, if you look, and, uh, and I invite you to do this, look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, and 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, about the character of the church. And the idea there is, we are not appointed to wrath. The church is not associated with wrath. God has taken us out of wrath as believers in Christ. But if you look at the tribulation and you read these scriptures these uh, from Revelation, chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 14, and others, you'll see that the tribulation is all about wrath and judgment. Okay, Wrath and judgment. That's the point of, of the tribulation. So if the church is not associated with wrath and judgment, then it's likely we're not going through the tribulation. Go ahead. Doesn't God's wrath start at the bowls, and before then it's uh, the Antichrist wreaking havoc? No, I don't agree with that. The, uh, the question was, you know, in support of the pre-wrath position, uh, was it, isn't God's wrath... You know, just basically the last portion of the tribulation with the bowls of wrath. No, I don't agree with that. Because in chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, when the first rider goes out conquering him to conquer, who sent him? According to the Bible. Who sent the first four riders of Revelation 6? Who dispatched them? Jesus Christ dispatches them. Jesus Christ sends that rider conquering him to conquer. Jesus Christ sends the second rider uh, uh, who, who has a, a, a large sword and causes war all over the, the world. Jesus Christ sends the third rider who sends famine uh, to the world. Jesus Christ sends the fourth rider who is death. Okay, and so that's a judgment program from God, you know, onto the earth. And uh, so, so I think clearly, again, that's an example of wrath, and the church is not associated with wrath and judgment, so I think that's a pretty strong argument uh, in favor of pre-tribulation rapture. Now, next week, I refuse to let any of you speak, okay? <laughs> so what we're going to do next week, no, this is good. It's good that we're discussing this, and I'm glad because, you know, I want you to get your thoughts out and get, and get secure in this, but we, we haven't gotten to where I want to get yet today. Uh, we will we will finish with this business of the rapture. I will show you the rest of the uh, the argument for pre tribulation rapture, and then from there we're going to get into a, a far more profound issue, and that is um, the the whole drama of Revelation four and five. What is going on? You're about to see a throne room, a throne room, very visual. You're going to see the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne. You're going to see four living creatures who are praising the Ancient of Days, and warning us as the audience, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In other words, watch your step because you, you violate this holiness, you're dead. Okay, be careful. You're going to see a great glass sea. You're going to, you're going to see a rainbow over the, over the throne. A very important rainbow, very thematic in the book of Revelation. You're going to see 24 elders, and I invite you to come back to class next week ready to talk about who these 24 elders are and to prove your case from Scripture. How can we do that if we can't talk? <laughs> you can talk. You can talk. Okay. 
<laughs> and, and, uh, but, but the other thing is, uh, come to class ready to discuss the significance of that number, 24. And I challenge you to find in the Bible the significance of the number 24. If you connect those dots, it'll be apparent to you who these 24 elders are. All right? We will then talk about uh, what happens in chapter 5, the great crisis of chapter 5, and why that is so meaningful to us, and how it sets the course for the rest of the book of Revelation. Okay? Closing comments, questions. Have a good week. See ya. Peace.